let's talk a bit about your study, assessment of relationship of ketamine dose with magnetic uh, resonance spectro spectroscopy, I probably butchered that, of GLX in GABA responses in adults with major depression, a randomized clinical trial. Um, so in the study, you assess the relationship between ketamine and its antidepressant effect. Can you just give a brief overview of what you guys did, what you found, and essentially what these findings suggest or how it may influence clinical practice and care? So the findings are terribly important. First of all, because this was a double-blind dose finding study. So if you ignore the brain imaging path that I'm going to tell you about in a moment, which was revolutionary, um, and focus on the dose finding path, that was very important because we measured we had different intravenous doses, including placebo, which is a zero dose, given to people in a double blind, randomized fashion. And then, in addition to that, um, we measured blood levels of the medication to try and get an idea of how much got into the blood, because people vary in the amount of the, actually the blood level that is achieved with a fixed dose of any medication. There can be a 20-fold variation in the blood level when you give a fixed dose of a medication to a, you know, a random group of people because the amount that's absorbed differs, the rate at which their liver and, and, um, breaks it down and the kidneys get rid of it. So the level needs to be considered. We discovered several things that were really critical. One, um, there's a very strong linear relationship between the dose and the degree of antidepressant effect. So the dose really matters. And that 0.5 milligrams, which they hit on as a fluke almost, turns out to be just about the sweet spot of where you want to be. If you give people a third of the dose or half the dose, you are predictably going to have less benefit. There's no need to measure blood levels because the blood levels correlated very strongly with the intravenous dose that was given. So, we learned that was very important from the clinician and the patient's point of view. When you give them 0.5, you're giving them the optimal dose. The second thing we learned was that there's really um, no relationship between the degree of clinical improvement, or not much of a relationship, and the side effects. You do not have to produce those side effects in order to get the clinical response. They seem to be involving slightly different actions of the medication, separable actions of the medication. That's, um, a lot of people didn't believe that. A lot of people always thought until the study that the side effects were in, in irrevocably coupled to the therapeutic benefit. You couldn't get them better unless they had those side effects. Um, that doesn't appear to be true. Then the next thing was, we, um, we did the dose finding study for a completely different reason, not in order to find the dose, but because we had done a previous study suggesting that ketamine could produce this reproducible effect in the brain on two important neurotransmitters, glutamate and GABA. They are the two most abundant neurotransmitters in the cortex of the brain, the outer, the outer part of the brain, gray matter. Um, and we wanted to see whether this effect had anything to do with the antidepressant effect. Now, it, this meant that we did something that really has never been done before. We gave the dose of the drug while they were in the PET scanner, and we took repeated pictures, if you like, of the measurements of the GABA and glutamate levels in the part of the brain that we thought was important for depression, continuously starting before the infusion, through the end of the infusion, and for a short time after the infusion. We were interested in like the Big Bang Theory, what happens at the very beginning of the antidepressant action. And because this drug acts so rapidly, that's even more interesting than it is for a lot of other medications. So the entire study was done with this intravenous infusion the patients went into the scanner depressed and most of them came out of the scanner much more cheerful. And while that transition was going on, we were taking pictures of their brain, measuring the levels of GABA and glutamate. Now, 
the scan of the method we had at the time, we now have a better method, um, didn't measure glutamate as directly. We, it was measured glutamate and glutamine, which is connected in a single peak. Well, that's where GLX comes in. That's a term for the combined and glutamine and, 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 and glutamate, but it doesn't matter. It's mostly glutamate. We're measuring mostly glutamate. Since then, we know how to measure glutamate. We've reanalyzed the data. The data, our findings apply to glutamate. So we know that for sure. All right, what we found was that when you're sitting in a scanner, confined in this narrow space, feeling nervous and tense, those two transmitters go up as part of a kind of response. What the, what the ketamine does is it attenuates this stress response. It's very good at attenuating stress responses in addition to being an antidepressant, which is why it's being tried in PTSD. But we saw this biochemically. We saw these peaks reduced of glutamate or GLX in exact proportion to the dose. Then we asked, is this sort of anti-GLX um, effect related to the antidepressant effect? So statistically, we were able to show that the antidepressant, the dose dependent antidepressant effect of ketamine was entirely explained or largely explained by this effect on the GLX peak in the part of the brain related to depression circuitry. So that was a separate discovery. It turned out GABA did not show that relationship, so we don't know what the role of GABA is in all this, but certainly the GLX effect is really exciting. This means that one could theoretically find another. And by the way, that GLX effect, unrelated to the side effects. Unrelated, which means one could theoretically look for compounds that will do what ketamine does, then um, find one that doesn't produce the side effects of ketamine that you don't like, like the tripping effect, the so-called psychotomimetic effect, then you could take a group of normal volunteers, put them in the, PET, in, the, um, in the MRI scanner, give them the ketamine, and see what impact there is on this GLX peak. By the degree of effect of these new candidate drugs on the GLX peak, we may not only be able to predict what's going to be an antidepressant, but how good it's going to be relative to ketamine. Because we have this dose response effect. So we have a curve, we have this data set sitting right there. Some pharmaceutical company could call tomorrow and say, got this drug, what do you think? I said, I could, I could say to them, you know what? In a few weeks, in some normal volunteers, we can tell you whether your drug might be an antidepressant like ketamine as good as ketamine, half as good as ketamine, twice as good as ketamine, and you wouldn't even have treated a single depressed patient. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's you know, we're pretty, we're kind of excited about this. We think this has a lot of potential.